clinic. Dr. Kosla trained, uh, when, uh, did his medical education at Harvard, did his training at the MGH, and then joined the Mayo Clinic in 1988. Over the years, he has distinguished himself with uh, an incredible number of publications and works, uh, and work both in the basic science and in the area of translation and research. He's probably only investigator that I know that really is equally familiar with basic science and, uh, and translation and uh, clinical investigation. He has been extensively recognized for his work. He has received uh, the most prestigious awards from the Endocrine Society, the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, and, and other uh, national and international uh, um, institutions. He is editor-in-chief of the journal Bone. He serves in the Council of NIH, and he is extremely well-funded. And he's also a terrific speaker, and today will uh, uh, share with us his findings about uh, the role of uh, cellular senescence in osteoporosis and other chronic disease. And with this, Sandeep, I really want to thank you for being here today. Thank you, Roberto, for uh, hosting my visit and your hospitality over the past uh, day or so. I really enjoyed meeting uh, colleagues from the endocrine group and, of course, uh, Bill Bornstein. Bill and I go way back more than 30 years. We were in the same lab together many years ago, so it was time to uh, nice to visit old friends. So I'm going to talk about what really is a new direction for my group over the past five to seven years that I think is an exciting new area that has implications not just in osteoporosis and frailty, but many other areas uh, of medicine. I don't have any relevant uh, financial disclosures. I'm going to talk mainly about osteoporosis and frailty because those are my uh, specific areas of interest. But I think given that this is a broader uh, medical audience, I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, some of the related areas where cellular senescence is uh, really making its presence felt, felt, if you will, as a causative uh, mechanism and potentially a therapeutic target. So let me start with what I know most about, which is osteoporosis. And there really has been remarkable progress over the past uh, 25 years or so in the treatment of osteoporosis. So you know, back in 1988, when I joined the faculty at Mayo, basically I could offer estrogen to women and calcium and vitamin D to men and, and little else. And you fast forward now to 2019, we have not only estrogen, but a, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, raloxifene, four bisphosphonates, a teriparatide, a baloparatide, denosumab, and last week, romososumab, a new anabolic drug for bone, was approved. Um, I put a danicatib in parentheses, that's a catepsin K inhibitor that actually was quite effective in terms of uh, preventing fractures, but uh, didn't come to market because of an unforeseen increase in, in stroke risk. And I think, at least for the osteoporosis field, but also for many other areas, including cardiovascular medicine, for example, the paradigm for drug development has really shifted from you know, observational or opportunistic to pathway-based driven by advances in fundamental bone biology. Uh, for example, romazosumab, uh, the newest drug on the market, really came out of uh, uh, rare families with high bone mass. And the development of romazosumab is actually kind of very similar to the PCSK9 inhibitors, which also came out of unusual families with uh, low cardiovascular disease. And I think for this, as in many other areas, these are prime examples of how the discovery science really is, in fact, translating into norm novel therapeutics. So with this, and you know, why do we actually new, need new drugs? I think uh, one is it's a huge public health problem. I, it's not well recognized uh, that the number of women who actually experience a fracture in one year, in fact, exceeds the combined number of women who experience incident breast cancer, MI, or stroke ac across all age groups. So I think osteoporosis, fracture, the morbidity, and in fact, mortality associated with it is in fact an underappreciated problem. There are still important gaps in the therapeutic arsenal. Uh, as many of you are aware, because of rare side effects, uh, particularly osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, 
and atypical femur fractures associated with very long-term bisphosphonate use, uh, there's this kind of media phobia about the use of uh, appropriate use of osteoporosis medications that's causing many patients who need these drugs to not take them and many physicians to not prescribe them. There's still questions about the most commonly used drugs, which are bisphosphonates, about their efficacy beyond five years. So we really don't have the perfect drug that could be used for uh, you know, a disease that's really a lifetime disease. And I think there's still a great need for new anabolic drugs. Uh, for all these drugs, even the new drug that was approved, it'll build bone for six to nine months. And then because we don't quite understand the biology, that effect wanes and the, the, the uh, ability of the drug to continue to stimulate bone formation disappears after a period of time. I think, you know, apart from those osteoporosis-specific issues, there is, in fact, as we look at our aging prob uh, population, a broader fundamental problem with all current treatments for osteoporosis or, or all other chronic diseases. And then basically it comes down to that the current treatment strategies for all of these aging comorbidities are disease specific. So each drug targets a single disease. So for cardiovascular risk reduction, we'll prescribe a statin and an antihypertensive, uh, antihyperglycemic agent for diabetes per, uh, uh, prevent, uh, treatment, a bisphosphonate for osteoporosis, and, and so forth. Inevitably, as we age and accumulate comorbidities, this leads to the, the problem of polypharmacy. There are some estimates that uh, almost 70% of adults take five or more uh, medications, and this leads to the increased risk of side effects, adverse drug interactions, and noncompliance. Uh, whether you look at a bisphosphonate for osteoporosis or statin for hyperlipidemia, less than half of the patients are, st are still taking the drug six months after the, it's been prescribed. And for osteoporosis in particular, uh, because the consequences of the disease don't manifest themselves until years later when they fracture, it kind of drifts down the list in terms of priorities. The busy primary care physician is often dealing with more per, uh, perceived pressing needs, such as the blood pressure of 180 or the blood sugar of 220. So osteoporosis often tends to get, get ignored. So, you know, it was in this context, uh, I, I actually moved my laboratory about 10 years ago from the endocrine group, actually, to the Center on Aging, because throughout my career, I was interested in bone biology and aging. And as I moved into kind of the broader geriatrics community, I really began to think about osteoporosis in the context, not by itself, but of all of these other diseases that all share aging as a common risk factor. So whether it's diabetes, dementia, vascular disease, macular degeneration, they're all linked in one way or the other to, to aging and fundamental mechanisms of aging. And this concept has really been formulated in an idea that's really very topical now in the geroscience community, which is the geroscience hypothesis that manipulation of fundamental aging mechanisms will delay in parallel the appearance or severity of multiple chronic diseases because all of these diseases share the same underlying risk factor, uh, namely aging. So learning from the geriatricians and gerontologists, it's really a new way to think about aging comorbidities, that instead of looking for disease-specific mechanisms specific for osteoporosis or vascular disease, why not look for aging mechanisms that are operating across tissues so maybe you could impact multiple diseases um, at the same time? Now, this is a nice list from a review uh, a number of years ago. Uh, the past several decades have seen an enormous amount of activity in the basic aging biology area. Uh, these mechanisms of aging that affect health span and lifespan have been worked out largely in animal models, principally worms and mice. And you'll recognize a, a number of these, uh, impaired proteostasis, telomere maintenance for endocrinologists. We've been always interested in perturbed insulin and IGF-1 signaling. Uh, AMP kinase signaling is of particular interest because that's the target of the drug metformin. And in fact, several years ago, Dr. Barzilai and colleagues at uh, 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 Albert Einstein uh, got approval from the FDA to start a clinical trial using metformin where the endpoint isn't MI or stroke or onset of diabetes, but it's a composite aging endpoint. And the FDA agreed to actually consider a clinical trial 
where your endpoint was aging parameters rather than disease-specific parameters. So for us in the Center on Aging at Mayo, cellular senescence has been a particular focus uh, for the past uh, five to seven years. So what is cellular senescence? It's a cell fate that involves essentially irreversible replicative arrest. Uh, there's activation of tumor suppressor genes, chromatin changes. One of the features that I'll keep coming back to is that senescent cells stop growing, but they're remarkably resistant to apoptosis. So they just sit there, whether it's in vitro and in vivo, and it's associated with increased rates of protein synthesis, particularly of the so-called uh, secretory-associated senescence phenotype of the SASP, which is really a massive sterile inflammation that these cells produce. It's not a new concept. It was actually de described in the 1960s by Dr. Hayflick as an in vitro phenomenon. So when he cultured uh, human fibroblasts, for example, they, they grew in culture until after a number of doublings, they, they sort of stopped growing, and he called this state uh, <coughs> senescence. So for a long time, senescence was thought to be primarily a in vitro phenomenon associated with proliferating cells. In fact, it's now well known that it occurs in vivo, and it also occurs in non-proliferating cells. Uh, for example, neurons, or cells that are quite similar and near and dear to my heart, which are osteocytes, but are very similar in many ways to neurons or hepatocytes or a whole host of other non-proliferating cells. So the idea is that uh, when you have young tissue, there's few, if any, of these senescent cells due to a number of cellular insults, radiation, DNA damage, all of the things that we're all exposed to, that with aging, we accumulate a burden of these senescent cells that are resistant to apoptosis. As I mentioned, they make this senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, which consists of pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemo chemokines, metalloproteinases, and this SASP is actually what causes tissue dysfunction with aging. So these cells accumulate at sites of aging, and the hypothesis has been is if you can somehow target these cells, and as I'll show you, either kill them selectively or inhibit the production of the SASP that maybe you can prevent or even re reverse some of the aging phenotypes. So the pathways associated with cell senescence have been well worked out by multiple groups around the world. So a number of insults, DNA damage, oncogenic mutations, reactive metabolites, mitogens, you know, so this ties into the insulin IGF system, telomere erosion, epigenetic stress, proteotoxic stress, and these damps, which are the damage-associated molecular pattern proteins, they activate two key genes. So it turns out that P16, INC4A, which is a cell cycle inhibitor, and the P53, P21 pathway. So you can see already that this cell could be on the way to becoming a tumor cell by proliferating in response to these uh, uh, insults. To some extent, and I'll come back to this point as sort of the two sides of senescence, senescence may have involved as an anti-cancer mechanism that instead of allowing that, this cell to proliferate, there's activation of these cell cycle inhibitors which cause the cell to go into the senescent fate so it doesn't cause cancer. The problem is that it upregulates these anti-apoptotic pathways, which have also been well worked out, which make it resistant to apoptosis. But because of the DNA damage response, there's also activation, particularly of NF-kappa B uh, and GATA4. And this leads to an increased uh, production of a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6 and the SASP. So, there's a price being paid by the tissue for chemo prevent for cancer prevention. It's these senescent cells that maybe pre are preventing the development of this cell from becoming cancerous, but it's also leading to this apoptotic resistant senescent cell that's uh, accelerating aging due to the production of the SASP. Now, if you look at the literature, there's a lot of interest in how do you target these cells, and really it boils down to two fundamental approaches. One is the so-called senolytic approach. So almost every group that's looked at the senolytic approach, even including the group at Mayo, has done some kind of transcriptional analysis to try to identify the pathways in different tissues, because they may be different in senescent cells from different tissues, that are upregulated, these so-called SCAPs, that are protecting the senescent cell from apoptosis, 
and presumably these are more upregulated than in the normal part of that tissue. So if you can find small molecules, either novel molecules or repurposed drugs that target these pathways, you might be able to kill senescent cells without affecting normal cells. So that's the so-called senolytic approach. The other is, is what's been called the xenomorphic approach, where you're not killing the senescent cell, but you're using agents that inhibit the production of the SASP. So you're basically neutralizing the cell. And the prototype of that that's been used uh, primarily in um, animal studies, but which is also used clinically, are JAK inhibitors. So it turns out that JAK inhibitors that are used in hematologic and rheumatologic conditions also inhibit the secretion of the SASP by these senescent cells. So uh, that's the so-called xenomorphic approach where the cells are still there, but you're trying to disable the, the production of the SASP. So P16 it turns out to be a key gene. It's also uh, the basis for a number of uh, m genetic mouse models that have taken advantage of trying to use this to selectively kill senescent cells. As I mentioned, it's highly upregulated and appears to be probably necessary, but not sufficient for the induction of cell senescence, although some cells may utilize more of the P21 pathway, but certainly P16 has been recognized as a key driver of cell senescence. So one of the first questions we ask, being primarily interested in bone, is what happens to bone? Does, bo does bone get senescent or accumulate senescent cells as we age? So here we, we looked at osteocytes, which remember are these long-lived cells that are kind of embedded in bone. It turns out they're kind of the master regulators of bone metabolism. Um, so we looked at osteocyte-enriched samples with aging in mice. And you can see this is in female mice. Starting about age 18 months, there's a dramatic increase in the P16 message. Uh, this is in males, maybe even happens a little sooner. Interestingly, mice start to lose bone at about six months of age. They sort of gradually lose bone. But after about 18 months of age, if you age um, um, black six mice, which is what this is done in, there's a dramatic bone loss. So this kind of end-stage dramatic age-related bone loss in mice does seem to correlate with upregulation of the P16 message in the mouse bones. We also looked at a number of other cell populations. We used a variety of techniques to try to isolate either osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes. And of course, I can't come to Emory and Roberta without talking about the immune microenvironment, uh, B cells, T cells, and, and myeloid cells. And it turns out P16 expression goes up in virtually all of the cell types uh, we looked at in the bone microenvironment. P21, it turns out, ended up going up mostly in osteocytes and P53 in osteocytes and in myeloid cells, but certainly P16 seemed to be going off uh, uniformly across the various cell populations. Now, one of the assays that's been used uh, to identify senescent cells is the so-called senescence-associated distension of satellites. So it turns out that when a cell gets senescent, the pericentromeric uh, DNA gets distended and uh, this is a osteocytes in vivo from, well, ex vivo, from either young bone or old bone. This is a nuclear stain. This is a fish uh, fluorescent hybridization probe for pericentromeric DNA. And you can see in the old osteocyte this distension of the pericentromeric DNA that you can quantify. And this is a fairly well accepted measure now of a senescent cell. And when we actually carefully quantified these, we found that compared to young mice, there was about a three to four-fold increase in the percentage of senescent osteocytes. Now, even in very old mice, and it turns out to be true across species, so if you look at different tissues in very old primates, you see about 10 to 12 percent of the cells in various tissues developing a senescence phenotype, depending on which, which marker you use. And this gets to the point that you don't need a lot of these cells to cause tissue dysfunction because they produce the SASP the sterile inflammation, there's this kind of amplifying effect of the deleterious uh, features of these cells. Conversely, I'll get to therapy, you don't probably need to get rid of all of these cells. You just need to reduce their burden by some modest amount to probably see some improvement in tissue function, and I'll show you some data uh, related to that. We looked at the SASP, which is a panel of about 40 different pro-inflammatory markers, and you can see this is in young mice versus old mice. You can see the marked upregulation of the SASP in 
osteocytes, uh, again, ex vivo. The other interesting population where the SASP really went up in mouse bone was in the myeloid cells. And there was a dramatic upregulation of the SASP in uh, myeloid cells isolated from the bone uh, microenvironment. We looked in humans. So these are tiny needle uh, biopsies of bone that we get from normal volunteers. It's kind of an, uh, we adapt the techniques that uh, hematologists have used to get bone marrow aspirates and biopsies, except we try to get more of the bone. And you can see from one of these biopsies, this is a micro CT. Uh, this is the trabecular bone and the cortical bone. And even in the unfractionated whole biopsies, you can see in old women compared to young women, a significant increase in the P16 and in the P21 message and in a number of the SASP uh, markers uh, in the old bones. So these initial studies told us, well, there's, there is in fact accumulation in bone as in other tissues of senescent, we think senescent osteocytes and predominantly myeloid cells, at least in terms of making the SASP because they have high expression of multiple SASP markers. And in fact, there were similar findings reported from the group at the University of Arkansas, where they found that osteocytes from old versus young mice had increased expression of another marker for senescence, the gamma H2X. They also looked at P16 and SASP markers. And this group actually linked this to increased production of this key uh, factor that mediates bone resorption, rank ligand, and an increase in cortical porosity or weakness of the bone in the mouse models. Uh, and they also found that these osteoprogenitor cells that expressed ostrix went down with age, and there was senescence in the osteoprogenitors also. So I think the evidence from multiple labs is now consistent with bone being, like other aging tissues, uh, harboring uh, an increase in senescent cells. Well, so correlation doesn't prove causality. Can you actually clear these cells and show some beneficial effects on bone? And for this, we took advantage of this transgenic mouse model developed by my colleague, uh, Jim Kirkland and uh, Jan van Dersen. So remember, I told you that the P16 is highly upregulated in senescent cells. So this is a transgenic mouse where the P16 promoter drives a fusion protein. It's FK binding protein with caspase 8, and there's a, a green fluorescent protein, so you can actually track in vivo and in vitro the senescent cells. So this promoter is active predominantly in senescent cells because it relies on P16. This fusion protein localizes to the membrane but remains inactive. So you can take these transgenic mice and they'll just be normal until you give them this drug, this AP20187, which causes dimerization of the FKB binding protein, and this then activates the caspase. So this model, which is the Incotac model, it allows for inducible elimination of P16-positive senescent cells when you give this drug. So it's cell-specific in that it seems to be relatively specific for senescent cells, and it's also, you can control the temporal elimination of the senescent cells by when you give the AP201 uh, drug. And in fact, in, in old mice, this is SA beta gal, which is another marker for cell senescence, you can see this is the epididymal fat tissue from an old mice, uh, but when uh, a mouse treated with the AP drug, uh, you can see clearance of these senescent cells from the fat tissue. So we asked the question, while well, we had shown the accumulation of senescent cells in bone, what happens if you clear these cells? So we took old mice, 20-month-old mice, and treated them for uh, four months, either with vehicle or the AP drug. These were the Incotac transgenic mice. And you can see the P16 message, which is a marker for senescence, the GFP message, which, as I told you, is uh, on the transgene that marks these senescent cells. Uh, there was systemic uh, reduction in senescent cells because they went down in adipose tissue. We also looked in bone. You can see the P16 and the EGFP message going down in bone. And we quantified the senescent osteocytes. There was about a 50% reduction in senescent osteocytes using the SADS assay. So the transgenic model worked. It was, in fact, clearing senescent cells in multiple tissues. And in fact, that was helping bone. So here's uh, the spine micro CT, either in a vehicle treated or an AP uh, treated mouse. You can see a significant improvement relative to the vehicle treated mouse in the spine bone volume fraction in a number of other trabecular parameters in the spine. 
The, the cell histology was interesting because we saw a reduction in the bone-resorbing osteoclasts. But interestingly, even over four months, we saw no change in the bone-forming osteoblasts. And this was unusual because resorption and formation in bone are tightly coupled. So if you give an anti-resorptive drug, such as a bisphosphonate or the rank ligand antibody, and you shut off resorption, because of this coupling of resorption and formation, bone formation goes down. So the osteoblast numbers would have gone down. But in fact, we weren't seeing any effect on osteoblast numbers. We looked at cortical bone. You can see the cortical thickness of the femur uh, went up, as did the femur strength. Again, a reduction in osteoclast numbers. But on cortical surfaces, we actually saw an actual increase in osteoblast numbers with an increase in the estimated bone formation rate, which we can measure using tetracycline labeling. And in fact, in further studies that I don't, don't have time to go into, but reflected by this, if we take conditioned media either from control cells or senescent cells and put that on osteoblastic cells, there are in fact factors in the senescent cell conditioned media that impairs the mineralization of osteoblasts, and this is quantified here. So in these studies, again, in, in data that I uh, don't have time to, sh to go through here, we actually identified factors in the conditioned media that stimulated bone resorption and inhibited bone formation. So these senescent cells were making factors as part of the SASP that were having these adverse effects on bone that you could improve by clearing the senescent cells. Now, obviously, the transgenic approach works in a mouse, but many groups and companies are actually now looking for drugs. So this was work done by my colleague, Jim uh, Kirkland, and he used an approach which, as I mentioned, almost everybody is using. So starting with the transcriptome analysis to show the increased expression of pro-survival networks in senescent cells. So what are the pathways that are making the senescent cells resistant to apoptosis? What, how are those different from the normal cells? And then siRNA was used to silence expression of key nodes in this network, and it was found that these siRNAs, in fact, killed senescent cells, but not proliferating or quiescent differentiated cells. And this is just a bioinformatic analysis showing some of the key pathways. Uh, the BCL2 pathway is particularly interesting and is being used by a number of companies, but there are a whole host of others. So in this study, actually, rather than a high-throughput drug discovery approach, which is really expensive, what was used was an in silico bioinformatic approach, basically a drug repurposing approach. So there are many known compounds already that target these pathways. So uh, this approach was used to match known compounds inhibiting these pro-survival uh, pathways, and about 50 combinations of compounds were screened in this paper. And it turns out that desatinib, which is a SARC family tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's FDA approved, for the treatment of CML, combined with a flavonoid, quercetin, actually was quite effective, the D plus Q, in killing senescent cells without affecting normal cells. Um, and periodic drug administration in a progeroid uh, aging model improved uh, uh, health span. Now, I'll come back to this point. These drugs have half-lives of hours. But the thought was that if they're targeting senescence pathways, that maybe they don't need to be around all the time. So in fact, even in this early study, the drug was administered at varying intervals once a week. So you know it can't possibly be that pathway-specific effect due to the tyrosine kinase, because that's a, that's a short half-life effect. So by inference and by similarity of these drug effects to the genetic clearance, it was that this combination was drug was working by killing senescent cells rather than somehow altering these specific pathways. So this intermittent administration turns out to be quite important, uh, both in terms of the risk and benefit ratio of these drugs, and I'll come back to that point. So we, you know, once Jim had identified D plus Q as a potential senolytic combination, we went back to our mouse model took 20-month-old mice and treated them either with vehicle or D plus Q. And we actually did some pilot studies where we treated the mice with D plus Q once a week, every other week, or even once a month. It turned out that once a month worked just as well as more frequent administration. So in this particular study, we only gave the D plus Q by oral gavage once a month to these mice. And again, you can see that was enough to reduce the P16 message in bone the senescent osteocytes in bone and the P16 message in adipose tissue, 
This is an SA beta gal showing senescent fat cells that are cleared uh, when you give, or reduced anyway, when you give the D plus Q. And the skeletal effects of using the drugs was almost identical, was in fact identical to the genetic clearance that I showed you. So again, here is trabecular bone, a very similar increase in the spine bone volume fraction, a reduction in the osteoclast numbers with no change in osteoblast numbers, again, an increase in the femur cortical thickness, and in cortical surfaces, again, a reduction in osteoclast numbers with an actual increase in osteoblast numbers and in the bone formation rates. So the final approach we used was the xenomorphic approach. So previous studies had shown that JAK inhibitors, as I mentioned, they don't kill the, the senescent cells, but they inhibit the secretion of the SASP. So if we took 22-month-old mice and treated them for two months, either with vehicle or the JAK inhibitor, you can see the findings here in trabecular bone and here in cortical bone were very similar. So it didn't matter how you targeted the cells, whether it was a genetic approach, a xenolytic approach using drugs, or a xenomorphic approach, you were having very similar effects on bone. So in terms of bone, we found that with established bone loss, two to four month treatment with any of these approaches, improved bone mass, microarchitecture, and bone strength, we found that this was, uh, if you target senescent cells, you suppressed bone resorption and either maintained or actually increased bone formation, which was unusual in terms of osteoporosis uh, therapies. And then in in vitro, we've gone on to show that the conditioned cell medium actually impairs osteoblast mineralization. Interestingly, with aging, you get less bone and more fat. It turns out that the SASP and the conditioned media of senescent cells uh, contributes to lineage switching of uh, bone marrow stem cells. So those cells are diverted more towards the fat lineage as opposed to the bone lineage. And uh, this condition media also enhances the, the survival of osteoclast progenitors, so you end up increasing bone resorption. And the other thing that we showed was that if you did any of these interventions in young mice, they didn't have any effect. So you really had to have a high burden of senescent cells for these senolytic approaches to work. If we took young Incatac mice and gave them the AP drug, if we took six-month-old mice and gave them the AP drug for a couple of months, there was absolutely no change in bone, either formation or resorption of bone microarchitecture, and similarly with the JAK inhibitor. So, uh, you know, this is some, a somewhat different anti-resorptive therapy. So. Uh, if you, if you use a bisphosphonate, it basically kills the osteoclast or bone-resorbing cell, so you get a decrease in bone resorption. But as I mentioned, because resorption and formation are coupled, you uniformly end up with a reduction in bone formation. We think that with the senolytic approaches, you're, you're targeting a more upstream problem. So if you eliminate senescent cells, you reduce osteoclast activity and reduce bone formation, but by clearing these cells, you also have beneficial effects on osteoblasts. So you either have no change in trabecular bone or an actual increase in cortical bone and bone formation, leading to what I would call kind of a beneficial uncoupling between bone resorption and formation. Now, the prediction would be that if you use these drugs for a long period of time compared to an anti-resorptive, because you're maintaining bone formation, over time, they should have a more beneficial effect on the skeleton. Obviously, time will tell when that comes to human studies uh, whether that's in fact true. So let me turn now to frailty because fra uh, f fractures occur not just because of low bone mass, but also because of falls and frailty. And uh, this is collaborative studies that we've done with Jim Kirkland's group, where the first question we asked is, uh, can you actually make young mice frail by implanting them with senescent cells? And if so, how many senescent cells does it take? So here we took six-month-old mice and either intraperitoneally gave them control cells or a range of senescent cells all the way from about 200,000 to about a million cells. And these were measured, uh, these were labeled with luciferase so we could track them in vivo. And you can see this is a mouse. You can see the luciferase. They pretty much stay in the peritoneal cavity 
So it turns out if you look at, you know, these are a number of different frailty measures. If you look at grip strength, which you can measure in the mouse and is a measure of mouse frailty, just as grip strength is a measure of frailty in humans. So this is just PBS. This is non-senescent cells, 200,000, 500,000, 1 million senescent cells just given into the intraperitoneal cavity. And you can see as few as a half a million senescent cells, which in the context of the whole organism is not a lot of cells, is enough to alter uh, physical function in, uh, a, in young mice. And in fact, one of the interesting things was that it was always known that in a paracrine way, a senescent cell, because of the SAS, can induce senescence locally. What well, turns out it can probably do it systemically because here are senescence and SAS markers measured in the quadriceps muscles. So the senescent cells are actually sitting in the peritoneal cavity in this young mouse and we measure P16 message in the quadriceps mu muscle, and you can see in the mouse that got the mice that got the senescent cells, a significant increase in P16 and in TNF alpha. So there seems to be the systemic feed forward loop whereby senescent cells can actually cause uh, cellular senescence and tissue dysfunction uh, systemically. We also asked, well, what happens in old mice? So these were old, 20-month-old mice, again, again, given D plus Q intermittently for four months. And you can see in these old mice, we did a number of measures. Here's, again, grip strength of physical function. There was improvement in frailty measures. If you cleared, now these are endogenous uh, senescent cells. We did transplant these old mice with cells. What was also exciting is there was not only an improvement in health span, but also in lifespan. So you can see post-treatment, there was about a 50-day increase in median survival in these mice using the senolytic uh, cocktail. Of course, you can imagine when this hit the media, there was a lot of interest in senolytic drugs extending uh, lifespan in humans, which, again, I would caution against because there are many, many interventions that improve, that make mice look live longer that never translate to humans. So I think... Uh, you know, I would take it with a grain of salt. But that said, our interest is not so much in lifespan. It, it is primarily in health span, in trying to ameliorate the aging comorbidities so that we all age in a more healthy way. So in terms of frailty, uh, frailty is increased and lifespan is reduced by increased senescent cell burden. Clearing senescent cell burden does, in fact, reduce frailty, frailty, and it actually increases lifespan. And it seems like there is this feed-forward loop whereby senescent cells induce cellular senescence, even in distance t distant tissues. And I think this is an important concept because in a given individual, there may be different burden of senescent cells in different tissues, and they may well be having a systemic effect. So in, in, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to just briefly give you kind of a tour of how this concept of cell senescence is really caught on in many different tissues. Uh, so here's from the Hopkins group. Um, when they looked at chondrocytes uh, from patients undergoing joint replacement surgery, there's an increased number of senescent chondrocytes present in cartilage from OA tissue. And then they went on to a ACL transaction model in mice, which causes an OA-like phenotype, and again, using a somewhat different mouse model, when they cleared senescent cells in the mice, this attenuated the development of post-traumatic OA, reduced pain, and actually increased cartilage development in the mouse. Uh, they also treated these mice with a senolytic molecule. This is uh, in collaboration with a company called Unity Pharmaceuticals. They're really targeting the BCL pathway. So they use Navitoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor. Um, that has systemic toxicity, but they injected it locally. Uh, and uh, they found that the senolytic molecule had very similar effects to preventing the development of post-traumatic OA, as did the genetic clearance of the, senetics, uh, of the senescent cells. CV disease, there's a couple of papers now. Uh, so this one used this 3MR model, which is very similar to the Incatac model. So it's just another model where the P16 promoter is, in this case, driving thymidine kinase. So in this model, instead of using that AP drug, you use gancyclovir to clear senescent cells. And you can see these are LDR knockout mice on a high-fat diet just as a control, and you can see the vascular uh, uh, disease developing in their aortas. So if you take these UMR mice and give them a vehicle, you see the same amount of vascular disease. 
But if you clear the senescent cells systemically, you can see prevention of the vascular disease in this high-fat model. And this is just quantified here. So which cells are becoming senescent in the vasculature that are targeted uh, by the senolytic approach isn't clear. Uh, but it seems like, at least in this high-fat model, there is a contrib contribution of senescent cells to the development of vascular disease. So there's a lot of interest in the cardiovascular community uh, to see if these drugs might uh, uh, have a role in uh, uh, cardiovascular disease progression. Metabolic function, this is from Jim's lab. Uh, this, uh, he, he, this is a paper from uh, several years ago. There's a more recent paper, an aging cell using senolytic drugs. But again, this is using a JAK inhibitor. These are old mice, either controlled or treated with the JAK inhibitor. You can see the improvement in glucose tolerance. And uh, you can also see, uh, uh, when we looked at insulin signaling, uh, phospho-AKT in fat tissue, uh, having after treatment with the JAK inhibitor, there's an increase in uh, insulin sensitivity. So there's a growing body of literature with aging uh, pheno metabolic phenotypes in mouse models that you can ameliorate some of the insulin resistance and glucose tolerance, again, by targeting uh, senescent cells. Perhaps most exciting is the very recent work related to dementia. So uh, there are two pap three papers now. Th this is from aging cell. So this is in a transgenic tau model in mice. You can see this is a staining for tau, and that treating the mice with D plus Q reduces the amount of tau positive cells and actually reduces ventricular volume. So this is the control mice, the tau positive mice, and then the tau positive mice treated with D plus Q. You can see a reduction not only in the tau positive cells, but in the ventricular volume. Uh, this is from the Boussian paper in Nature, where they actually did some cognitive testing. And you can see uh, in this particular study that uh, uh, that with training, that there's an improvement in wild-type mice. But in these tau transgenic mice, that's, uh, that, that disappears. But when you treat them with the AP drug, they look more like wild-type mice in terms of their learning capacity uh, to solve different cognitive tasks. And really hot off the press, this came out last week in Nature Neuroscience from the NIA intramural program. So they actually used D plus Q uh, to look at a, um, um, a beta-associated oligodendrocyte progenitor cell senescence and cognitive defects and showed that using D plus Q in this mouse model actually improved cognitive function in the mice. In this paper, they actually have some human data showing that in human brains, uh, that uh, are expressing the Alzheimer's plaques, they are co-expressing senescent cell markers. So it appears that the amyloid and the other inflammation in these uh, neural cells is actually triggering cell senescence and clearing those senescent cells, at least in a mouse model, uh, appears to have beneficial effects. There's actually now NIA is supporting uh, a multi-site clinical trial uh, very early phase uh, uh, at, uh, Sa at San Antonio at Mayo uh, to look at patients with significant cognitive impairment to see if there's some effect on progression. This I found particularly interesting. This is from uh, Deanna York's group, who was at Newcastle and just joined the Mayo group. And it turns out that obesity is actually associated with increased in SSL burden, but also with neuropsychiatric disorders, including anxiety and depression, even in mice. And what Deanna's group showed that in mice, if you give them a high-fat diet, they develop these senescent glial cells with excessive fat deposits, and you can measure anxiety behavior in mice. So they actually get anxious as they're given this high-fat diet. And you can actually reverse that anxiety-related behavior uh, and restore neurogenesis by clearing these senescent glial cells again in this case, they use the D plus Q uh, combination. So it seems like there are many different potential areas where uh, senescence pathways are, are likely to, uh, to play a role. So I think the hope is that if you look at what's happening to all of us as we age, there's an increasing burden of senescent cells in different tissues. So we go from youthful function to various inducers of cell senescence until we reach a point where there's enough of these cells where we start to see these aging comorbidities which then leads to frailty, sarcopenia, uh, and eventually death. So even if we can't, and maybe we don't want to affect lifespan, even if we can just block this and extend health span, uh, 
So we have delaying of these comorbidities. I think that would be a enormous uh, a beneficial effect in terms of quality of life and cost to the healthcare system. So I think that's really the hope is can you use these drugs and future drugs in a way uh, that reaches this goal. So clinical trials have started. One was actually published. It turns out that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a disease associated with aging, both in humans and in a mouse model using uh, bleomycin, is actually associated with the accumulation of senescent cells. And at least in the mouse bleomycin model, if you clear those cells, you improve lung function in the mice. So uh, D plus Q is actually a proof of concept study been used in a small cohort of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It seemed to be well tolerated. There's not enough data to know uh, in terms of functional changes, although some of the frailty measures did improve in those patients. The caveats are it was unblinded. It was just a very early proof of concept study. The other interesting area is it turns out that ca cancer survivors have a high, so when you give chemotherapy, in fact, one of the best ways to induce cell senescence in a mouse model is to use doxorubicin. So most chemotherapeutic drugs cause an increased burden of senescent cells. And as the cancer uh, oncologists know, that most childhood chemotherapy survivors tend to have an accelerated aging phenotype. They develop metabolic syndrome, they develop uh, osteoporosis over time, a whole host of aging phenotypes. And it seems to be associated with an increased total body burden of senescent cells. So this is a pilot study evaluating the efficacy of D plus Q in clearing senescent cells and measuring some intermediate outcomes in patients following hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And we're also looking at bone turnover and frailty in older women uh, using a different senolytic drug, perhaps alone and maybe even in combination with desatinib. Uh, but facetin is another flavonoid that seems to have uh, senolytic activity. So there are concerns. Uh, remember, I, one of the things I stressed earlier was that it is, in fact, likely that the senescence pathway developed as an anti-cancer mechanism. Because if you think about it, there's all these triggers, DNA damage, that's going to cause the cell to proliferate. So the cell responds by activating the cell cycle inhibitors, which then cause it to go into senescence, and the price you're paying is accelerated aging. So do you want to die of cancer or do you want to die of old age? Well, maybe you can find that middle ground where, you know, you delay both. Um, so... Uh, it probably did evolve as cancer, but I think the, the, the ways around this is really to find the therapeutic window. So if we can give senolytic drugs intermittently, so we don't actually keep these cells from forming and performing their critical anti-cancer function, but just intermittently reduce the burden of these cells, then maybe we can find the right therapeutic window where you increase health span without causing an increase in cancer incidence. The other thing that's becoming, there's a lot of interest in the cancer field in senescent cells because as the cancer stroma becomes senescent, that actually, that SASP actually is, is tumorogenic. So there's actually interest in using senolytic approaches in combination with chemotherapy to actually improve the efficacy of the chemotherapy because the senescent cells within the cancer microenvironment actually feed onto the cancer cells to make that more aggressive. So uh, the relationship of cell senescence to cancer is complex, and I think is a cautionary measure to not just run out and start, you know, in fact, when Jim and uh, Paul Robbins at University of Minnesota published this paper online on facetin as a senolytic drug, you can buy facetin from Amazon. Amazon was actually sold out for a few days of facetin as people went and started, and then I got, you know, uh, Jim got most of the calls, but even I got a few calls. Uh, it was a, 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 a patient uh, physician, actually, who called me who had osteoporosis and wanted to know how much facetin to take. And I said, you know, not yet. Um, you know, we're still working on this. Uh, development in wound healing, it turns out like most of these mechanisms, senescence actually is uh, uh, present during development. So programmed cell senescence actually occurs uh, during embryonic development. It's probably a different type of self-limited senescence, but the features of upregulation of P16 and so forth are very similar. Relevant to bone, turns out that the primary spongiosa of long bones, this has been studied in mice, uh, there, there's programmed cell senescence of uh, the uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells in the spongiosa, which is associated with 
uh, fusion of the growth plates. So there, uh, there are physiological uh, 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 scenarios where senescence does occur. Probably the most interesting is in wound healing. It seems like acute injury does trigger cell senescence in a subset of the cells, and that senescence is important to attract repair cells, immune cells and other cells that help repair the wound. So in this skin injury model, for example, if senescent cells were eliminated at the time of wound injury, it actually delayed skin healing. So there may be implications for, again, the therapeutic window of how you clear senescent cells and when you clear senescent cells. You probably don't want to give these drugs right after a patient fractures, for example, until we know more about uh, the role of these cells in wound healing. So people often ask me, uh, you know, well, short of drugs, what can I do to reduce my burden? You know, we're all senescing by the minute, if you will. Uh, so I've showed you that aging clearly increases cell senescence. High fat diet in mice and in humans increases senescent cell burden. Uh, physical inactivity, smoking, using a variety of senescence biomarkers, it turns out that these kinds of insults in humans have been shown to increase senescent cell burden. I already mentioned chemotherapy and radiation, and, and Neil and I were talking about earlier about uh, HIV infection, chronic HIV infection is in fact associated with uh, increased senescent cell burden in a number of different tissues. Uh, in mice, if you give them a high fat diet and exercise them, you can prevent the increase in cell senescence induced by the high fat diet. So certainly exercise is a simple intervention that will help reduce the burden of senescent cells. And certainly in mice, if you caloric restrict them, you can reduce or eliminate some of the increase in senescent cell burden associated with aging. So you come back to those same old you know, diet and exercise as yet another way that would help health span and lifespan. Uh, it's just that it's not as easy as taking a pill from Amazon, and unfortunately we don't have that as yet. So I think I would recommend sticking to these activities till we know more. I wanted to end, Josh Farr did a lot of the work on the bone phenotypes that I mentioned. Megan Vaivoda and Ming Zhu, Ming in particular, did the frailty work. Uh, these are some of the other folks. Um, uh, Jim, I've collaborated with now for almost a decade, who really, I think, uh, changed my thinking from just being a osteoporosis and a bone biologist to thinking more about aging across tissues and really helped broaden the scope of my uh, scientific thinking and the number of other colleagues and collaborators and then funding that we get from NIA and IAMS and the uh, Mayo Foundation. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very interesting. Can you talk a bit more about uh, uh, hormonal influences on senescent cells? Uh, is there Estrogen, obviously, in the osteoporosis world. Uh, what about growth hormone? What about estrogen effects on senescence? And the second question has to do with immune recognition of senescent cells. Is there any evidence that PD-1 or other, uh, is there an opportunity for immunotherapy yeah. in that? So in terms of hormonal influences, I think the main, one of the main drivers of cell senescence seems to be increased insulin and IGF-1 signaling. So you know, that may be part of the way why, you know, the dwarf mice are protected from aging. They have low IGF-1 levels, and they likely have a low senescent cell burden. Estrogen is particularly interesting, and in, um, we recently completed some studies where we gonadectomized young mice at six months of age, either male or female, and we also took older women in their 70s and treated them with estrogen and at least in those models, young mice gonadectomized for two months or older women treated with estrogen uh, for about three weeks, we couldn't find any changes in cell senescent markers. So, you know, which is not to say that, you know, with old age, there's some interaction between chronic estrogen deficiency and cell senescence, but they really seem to be somewhat different uh, pathways and, and relatively independent uh, pathways, at least as far as we've been able to tell uh, at this point. Other hormonal influences um, they really have not been well characterized between uh, beyond kind of the IGF system. Uh, there is some older literature that uh, the PTH receptor 
the PTHRP signaling might affect cell senescence, uh, but uh, that hasn't been well worked out. And uh, so that I mean, that's kind of about kind of where we are. Immune recognition is a really important question because one of the unresolved questions is that do you have more senescent cells in old organisms simply because there are more of those cells forming? Or is it because compared to young people, the old immune system just isn't clearing them? Uh, because the young immune system may be so robust that, that as these cells form, they're rapidly cleared by the immune cells, but that's just not happening with, with aging. But the specific role of the PD-1s and the, the, the PDL uh, inhibitors, that really has not been looked at, to my knowledge. Anyway, I'll show. Uh, in terms of the caloric restriction, what I've seen in terms of uh, slowing the aging-related loss of urine concentrating ability, the mice get restricted from a very young age. Is I don't know about any other effects of caloric restriction, but is it do you have to start it at what would be a, the equivalent of a pediatric age in people, or? Can you get benefit from that if you wait till you've got gray hair like me? Uh, at least in the mouse models, well, the question is whether, you know, in terms of caloric restriction, do you have to kind of start that in a very young mouse, uh, almost a pediatric age, for it to be effective? The study that I'm thinking about in terms of the mouse model, it was actually in adult mice that had a high burden of senescent cells. So if they were continued on their, you know, lab, chow versus calorically restricted, it seemed to have a beneficial effect even in, in older animals in terms of senescent cell burden. And the effects of high-fat diet are really very dramatic. You take a mouse and give them a high-fat diet, they'll get senescent cells in multiple tissues. Right. So the question is, in terms of diagnosis, you know, uh, are there biomarkers, basically, or are there ways to sort cells to look at the percentage of senescent cells? And, and that's, that's a big issue right now, because there isn't a good way for, to measure systemic senescent cell burden. It also could be tissue-specific. So, for example, somebody gets, you know, radiation treatment to the lungs, there's probably a lot of senescent cells there that are having a systemic effect. But if you biopsy the skin of the thigh, you wouldn't necessarily see. You might see some because of this feed-forward effect, but probably not what you saw in the lung. Uh, so several groups are trying to look at panels of biomarkers and the sensitivity and specificity of PI-1, uh, IL-8, or a whole host of kind of uh, cytokines, which are not completely specific for cell senescence. Uh, the other assay that is popular that's actually offered commercially is one that Ned Sharpless developed when he was at UNC before he moved to NCI. And we've implemented that in, in our lab. Basically, you harvest peripheral T cells. It turns out that it seemed to work the best with T cells as opposed to B cells or monocytes. And so you basically do a quick uh, magnetic cell sorting for T cells. And using a TACMAN assay, you measure the P16 message in the T cells. And he showed in population studies that that went up as people aged, and that's actually where the correlations that I mentioned with smoking and physical inactivity, because he found that the more physically active people had a lower P16 message in the T cells. So in my mind, that's probably the best assay right now. It's known that a lot of senescent cells are, are huge extracellular vesicle factories. So there's a lot of interest in harvesting EVs from peripheral blood and looking at microRNAs or other proteins that might identify these senescent cells. Uh, there's many things to learn from the marked difference in the way these processes, the rate at which these processes develop. 
different species, like in a rat within a few years, and in a human over 70 years, in a whale over maybe 200 years or something like that. Why yeah. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. You know, why why do different species age at different rates? I think, you know, there's a turtle turtle that lives hundreds of years. And um, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I don't want to get too myopic because their senescence is probably one of at least nine fundamental aging mechanisms. You know, I mentioned there's, you know, senescence, uh, uh, prote proteostasis, uh, sirtuins. I mean, there's a whole host of these, and they all seem to interact. So if you if you manipulate the sirtuins, it alters senescence and vice versa. So I mean, we've been particularly interested in senescence. It's a it's an attractive therapeutic target, but I think when you start comparing across species or even across humans, there are probably many different you know pathways operative. I mean, for example. When we look at that P16 assay, and we looked at a bunch of young women and old women, and we just tried to establish a normal range of the P16 message in young women, because our idea was, in a kind of an R21 that we proposed, that if we want to use uh, senolytic drugs to look at bone turnover in older women, we wanted to be able to stratify them with a high versus low senescent cell burden. So when we look at old women over about 70, about half of them have a P16 message that's above what the range you might see in young women. Well, they're still old. Now, maybe some of them are just healthier old, or maybe they have other aging mechanisms outside of senescence, one of these other eight uh, that are operative. In, and so each of us may have a different combination of aging phenotypes. And I think you know, the ultimate hope would be that you'd have a way to get a composite pathway score you know, that you add them all up, and that's how old you are. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you.